those of you that are online, put them online. Uh, my name is uh, Martin Perez. I'm the dean of one of seven faculties of our university, uh, which is a management organization. Uh, and I'm here because I have the honor to open this event because the programs communication, also international communication management, are part of our faculty. And I'm really proud to open this year because of three reasons. First of all, of course, is the topic, the really relevant topic, especially today, but always actually. Um, so I'm really excited to hear what you, for instance, have to say and how the discussion can go. Of course. Uh, but secondly, also because we uh, we co-host this with the municipality of the Hague, also with the uh, Dutch uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and also of course with the Hague Talks, very uh, big here on stage. Um, but most uh, proud I am of uh, this event because it was organized by our students, and that's always a very interesting and good learning environment and experience. Um, it gives me great pleasure to open this and to give the floor to you, Ekle Gominat. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes. Okay, and then my job is done, I think. I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. So, good afternoon, and I'm really happy to welcome you all here today. And hello to everyone on the live stream. So welcome to the Hey Talks. I am Anna Rumanaita and I will be a moderator for this event today. So today's topic is to how to overcome challenges in reporting justice. For those who are in the Hey Talks for the first time, the Hey Talks is a meeting place for creative minds, peace inventors, and game changers in the field of peace and justice. It's a stage and a breathing place for new ideas and perspectives, a forum for discussion, and a starting point for concrete actions. This is a great opportunity for all of us to come together and discuss this topic, and I want to encourage you all to be part of this event and ask questions, share your opinions, and have a discussion with our guests. I also want to invite you to follow the Hague Talks on Instagram, Facebook, and on Twitter. Today, we will have a three knowledgeable speakers, each unique story to tell. And without further ado, we will begin with Hossein from Afghanistan. He is an Afghan cartoonist who will share his experience living in Kabul and the importance of the free expression. Please give a massive applause to the Hossein Radia. I'm really happy to be in a university building again, especially as beautiful as Hague University of Applied Science, and also among you fine people. Actually, I was wondering how many of your teachers ever scared of his of of their student in your in your university? Because when I was working as a lecturer in a small university, a private university in Afghanistan, I felt scared of some of my students getting more and more radical. Actually, in Afghanistan. Educational places and universities for a certain group of people are the place of danger. By the way, I will come back to this story again later. I am Hussein Rizai. I was born and raised in Iran as a refugee. Despite all the hardship, I managed to get my bachelor and then my master in architecture and get back to Afghanistan with a lot of hope and dream. To a place that I have been called Azora minority and Shia minority. We have been discriminated against, killed, persecuted, oppressed <coughs> during the last two centuries. We prefer to be invisible in order to be safe.
safer. Until in the last two decades, we found education. In fact, we found the opportunity of being educated. We realized that the power of education, we could make our future a better future. Even we could make our country a better country. And even we can bring some change to the world. But unfortunately, in our country, so many other people think otherwise. Reality in Afghanistan are really harsh, naked, exaggerated, because of, uh, how can I say? The way that it hits you, you cannot digest it easily. It just hit your heart, as I remember. It was 8th of May 2021, a car full of explosive material drove up to, a front, to the front of a school with girls, a girls a school detonated, killed so many young people. When those students, scared of first explosion, rush out two other one, set off and killed more than 100 and wounded more than 200 innocent school girls. Friend alongside the friends, classmate alongside the classmate, and sibling alongside the sibling, all battle on top of a hill together. Actually, I've seen so many attacks like this in Afghanistan. When you see them, you don't know if you can cry, scream, show sympathy with those who lost their loved one. You feel really powerless. Those incidents changed me. I was at university lecture with a bachelor of, with a master of architecture, a small company doing construction <coughs> work, I start drawing a cotton, political cotton, with a lot of danger and no pain, no income at all. I stopped publishing my cartoon in my social media, after that in some newspaper. I see the people's reaction. I see the people's reaction, those who lost their love and I start doing more and more and more. Actually, it was not always that smooth. In some period of the time, I felt hopeless. I saw my handful of cartoons cannot bring change to the world, or the change was really small. I thought being a political cartoonist is a ridiculous thing because I saw the magnitude of suicide attack and also the size of my car. Even I quit, I do not draw a cartoon for more than six or seven months. After a while, I reached this conclusion that Doing nothing exactly is the thing that those people who attack us to stop us going to their school, being educated. And then I start drawing cotton again and again. I know it is a really small change and 
made me, it could bring me a really, really small change. But I saw sometimes a small change can bring a big difference in some people's life. Thank you. The first step is to try to criticize. And when you are faced with a radical government like Taliban, uh, how can I say? Maybe your first mistake is your last mistake. Uh, I don't know how can I uh, explain it, but the uh, situation getting worse and worse and freedom of speech getting more and more limited and just this I think. Yes, thank you so much and yeah, you can go to the can see. Thank you. <laughs> International Criminal Justice and Human Rights. Today she will talk about the danger of fake news and disinformation. Please welcome Janet Santali. Uh, seek to promote a 
balanced discussion in international criminal justice in the media, and also advocate for justice and reparations of victims of violence through <coughs> reporting. I report on international criminal justice and human rights violation, which includes I follow and monitor trials and proceeding at the International Criminal Court and other international tribunals. Through my reporting, I've been able to be provided with the opportunity to call out impunity whenever it occurs, compel other state actors to act. Additionally, I'm also able to inform and educate citizens on how they define justice, how they see justice, as well as providing them with reliable and usable information on how the global justice system works in seeking justice to victims. Uh, working as journalists for justice, I've been able to document stories of victims and survivors of violations and also connect them to institutions that offer redress to some of these violations. When I started reporting, my biggest challenge was I had no journalistic training, but I've been able to build that. Um, I've been able to bridge that gap by, based on my criminal justice background. Slowly, I've been able to transition, and I'm now accredited to the journalist. I enjoy my kind of reporting because um, my priority is to inform and empower other people on their rights, as well as identifying human rights gaps across the world, that take place across the world. In this digital uh, age, I've also, uh, the social media has become the supreme media channel. And I've also been able to adapt and develop um, online content for my audience. I've been able to keep up to speed with the rapid development of technology that has changed the journalistic practices in terms of gathering stories, compiling stories, and disseminating them. I'll give an example of the Kenyan cases that um, I brought to the International Criminal Court. And um, Kenya has been, has a history with the International Criminal Court because of the violence that has haunted elections since 1992. In 2007, Kenya experienced a level of violence that shocked the conscience of humanity. Attacks engulfed in different parts of the country, leading to 1, 000, more than 1,000 people dead and 500,000 displaced. These cases unfortunately collapsed in the ICC because of the intensive campaign to intimidate witnesses. Some were end up, end up being killed, some were induced to recant their evidence, and some were intimidated not to testify. During the, these trials, the digital technology had not taken, was just starting to take shape. <coughs> So Kenyans relied on information from the local media, media stream, media mainstream. And um, the suspects and their agents harnessed the media to serve their own purpose. They changed the narratives, casting themselves in the modes of victims of Western and imperialistic actors. The plight and voice of this great victims was drawn out. The campaign was effective. The drive to control the formation of these cases. Even now, there is very little information about these cases, despite the local media reporting it widely, pointing out to a possibility of digital erasure. This uh, new technology, or rather the digital technology landscape has also changed how we, how our culture consume mass media. 
People have now the power to express themselves through social media, blogs, blogs, other online platforms. The new digital platforms has also unleashed innovative journalistic practices where it has enabled the form, another form of communication and a greater global reach than any part in human history. The new technology has also brought its opportunities and challenges, and challenges such as disinformation and hoaxes that are commonly referred as fake news. When the major arena of disinformation is social media, I had to keep um, the powerful actors or powerful, yeah, powerful actors are now using or instrument, instrumentalizing fake news to serve their purpose. In an ongoing Kenyan case, the prosecutor versus Kenyan lawyer Paul Gisheru, who is currently facing charges of corruptly influencing witnesses in the main case that I have just spoke about. During the beginning of his trial, he pleaded not guilty. A few seconds, a manipulated video went viral saying that he pleaded guilty. As I was aware of this trial, I was able to fact check the video and turned it online in our social media accounts as fake video. Why do someone like me from the remotest past of the world interested in criminal, international criminal justice? It's because it has given me a promise of accountability that no matter where you are, how powerful you are, accountability catches up with you. As a custodian of information, as my role as journalist for journalist justice, I have taken it to heart to create online communication communities to promote justice for victims and also prevent the occurrence of any form of violence that is going to happen through balance and accurate reporting. I spend most of my time in the day working behind my laptop, a very special kind of journalism, by the way, that I need to research and also understand complex issues before, before providing the information to my audiences. And as students of journalism or communication, how do we ensure that the information we give out there is verified? How do we correct this issue of fake news? And how do we objectively report in this digital era as we are easily sidetracked with false information? Thank you. Yes. from you and maybe someone in the audience can answer one of them. So how do you students and by myself also students, how do we ensure that the information which we're getting online is verified and it's not a disinformation? <coughs> do someone wants to share? Yes, I give a hand here. I think as a student and as a uh, person in general, I think that where we can verify and make sure it's not fake news is to find another source that con confirms what we're going to share. And just I want to do a little comment on fake news, just my personal opinion, that I don't think it's possible to get rid of them. I think with the, with the digital world we live in, as you mentioned, uh, just more and more people have access to 
share any kind of information they possibly want. I think it's really important to clean the pages, not to just you know get rid of them if it's impossible, but learn how to divide pages and the actual pages. Thank you so much. And I also wanted to ask you a question. How do you verify if it's a fake news or a real news when you're searching? I'll say, like the example I've given before, is that I ensure before I disseminate any information, I do research. And as the video that was going around, I was following the trial, so I knew Thank you so much, and please, applause for <laughs> Yes, and now, the last but definitely not the least, Oksana Kovanaiko from Ukraine. She will be describing her day-to-day -day challenges of working in a war zone and how her work connects to the possibility of war crime justice. Give a warm welcome to Oksana Kovalenko. Hi everyone. <clears throat> so what is like to be a journalist in Ukraine? <clears throat> when I first uh, heard sounds of the war, the 21st of February, um, I thought, well, the war started. What the, journal the journalist should do in this uh, situation, you write the news. So I wrote the news and my hands were shaking. And then uh, my other colleagues woke up and they started to work and we all were scared. Uh, we worked on adrenaline rush for about a month, but then the adrenaline gone and we, were work well, we all were exhausted. And now we are all exhausted and um, I was I realized that I'm uh, working very slowly. I cannot concentrate and I have problems with my work. Uh, it bothered me a lot, so um, I wrote a post in Facebook and asked if anyone feels the same. And I found out that approximately 70 people answered me and they told me that they are feeling the same. They were not only journalists, there were people of other professions, and they also um, felt the same. So this is the answer how Ukrainians feel, not only Ukrainian journalists. As to Ukrainian journalists, I also can say that now it is three months that we have a war, and some of our journalists already have post-traumatic stress, and I'm sure there will be more. Um, one day I was um, scrolling <coughs> my Facebook uh, and saw a story of a family of four people, uh, two parents and two girls. They escaped from Kiev to suburbs when the war started. They thought that it would be safe um, not in Kiev but in suburbs, but they were wrong and the Russian occupants they came to the suburbs first. They occupied their village. There were shillings all the time, and the fire was all the time. So they decided to leave. It was dangerous, but it was more dangerous to uh, be uh, in this village. So they took to their bars, and uh, one girl, one daughter who was nine years old, and her name was Valeria, he um, got in one car with her mother, and another girl who was 15 years old, uh, he, she was in another car with her uh, father. They uh, went out of the village, and they got on the fire. Uh, the parents died, they were killed. The, uh, the older uh, uh, sister, she was injured in her, in her leg, so they couldn't walk away. They couldn't hide. Um, then the Russians came, they were on their tanks, and they took both girls away in different vehicles. Um, then they went to a village. They dropped off the younger girl, just gave, 
gave her away to a strange family, and uh, no one knows <coughs> where the older girl is. She is 15 years old. She is very nice young lady, and we all heard about the rapes, about the killings, about all this things which are happening to people and no one knows where she is. Uh, uh, some witnesses say that soldiers told that they will take this girl to the uh, hospital in Belarus but we couldn't verify, no one couldn't verify this. Uh, Belarus doesn't give this information even for Ministry of Foreign Relations. Uh, so um, what I think, I found, when I read, read the story in Facebook, I found out that some of my friends know this family and I've decided to help. Um, I decided to make my own, my own investigation, uh, to go to the place, to meet people, to ask them questions and try to follow all the directions uh, the girls went and then the Russian soldiers went to the Belarus um, and tried to find some if, some news, some information, maybe someone saw this girl, maybe someone knows something. Um, but to do so, um, I need more time and what is strange, I need more petrol because here in Ukraine I have only 10 liters of petrol in my car and I have no any chance to get more because the Russians destroy our Ukrainian infrastructure. Uh, they uh, destroy refinery plants, all refinery plants. Uh, they destroy uh, railways. So it's impossible to get any fuel and I cannot go anywhere. So, <clears throat> um, I, I still want to help this family, and I hope I will do it um, a little bit later. And by the way, uh, I don't know what is written in textbooks. Should the journalist help to people who they write about? Um, personally, me, um, I can compare it when I watch movies, documentaries about wildlife, um, like animals living in the wild, and I always wonder how it may happen when people who film this, they see how the cops are being killed by others, by other animals, and these people who film this, they don't save them, they don't do anything. For me, it's like, I just can't understand how it happened. I always want to help. That's why, uh, maybe, this is the reason why in 2014, when Russians um, occupied our Crimea, they um, also wanted to take part of uh, another part of Ukraine. And our, war, our, our army was uh, in very bad condition. They didn't have any uh, vests, they didn't have any helmets, they even didn't have any boots. Um, so, what I decided, I decided to help, and um, I was, as a journalist, I had an audience um, who trusted me, and um, also as a journalist, I could, um, I had an access to soldiers, so I knew what they needed, so I gathered the list of the equipment they needed, then I asked, I thought about this to my audience, they I gave the money, I, I could buy the things and then go to the front line and to bring these things to the soldiers. And there I uh, had an opportunity to um, find the stories because I could uh, see soldiers, I could hear the sounds of explosions, um, I could realize what they feel. Um, I could interview them, I could see the other people who, who were living in, in the war. So I brought stories back and we published them. <coughs> Everyone supported me in this, uh, but uh, my editor-in-chief, she was a bit worried because well, she was not very happy, 
with what I was doing because she was very worried about my security and safety. Um, and then once I was talking to an American journalist, uh, I described to him what I was doing and he told me that I'm wrong. I shouldn't do that because journalists can only write the stories. They cannot participate on like in anything. They just write the stories. That's it. And you know what? I uh, probably would agree with him, but not in this situation because uh, he lives in the United States. This country didn't have war on their territory for about 200, 200 years. And this war, it means that <coughs> if we fail, there will not be Ukraine. And no one will meet, need me as a Ukrainian journalist. I mean, no one will need me as a journalist at, at all because there will not be my country. And I have a question for you. What would you do on my place?
So basically, I, I, I don't do a lot of, uh, I do also a lot of uh, field work when going to communities and also telling them that uh, this is what is happening in our country, this is uh, what is out there, yeah. Thank you, and thank you for your question. I saw you had another hand. Yes? Um, my question is for Janet and Sunny. Um, I was wondering if you were in the same, if you were in a similar situation as Oksana was. Uh, and like the question that she asked us, what would you do? Definitely, I will do whatever I could uh, because I've experienced that when you're living among your people, your loved one, you're seeing, you're dying in front of your eyes. In that time, you are more human than a professional, for example, cartoonist or journalist because you could feel that pain, you could see that pain, and I think even, I believe it's kind of uh, not acceptable from a human being to be neutral and to say I'm a professional, for example, a and I'm not supposed to get involved in other matters, and definitely do whatever I could do. Then, Sometimes fighting is an answer. Yes, and I think also I'll do the same thing as what Oksana is doing. Um, you can't separate yourself from being a human being and doing a profession. So basically, as a human being, I will try and help and also play my part as a journalist. Thank you so much, and thank you for your question. Do we have any other questions? Yes, I see here. I have a question for all three of you. Um, the Hague is a place where we have these processes and these um, sometimes criminal trials and other things that happen, but that's very far away from each of your countries. and. I'm wondering whether in Afghanistan, in Kenya, in Ukraine, is there a sense of you know, what, what the Hague might mean or what the Hague can do for you? Or is it too far away from, uh, from people in each of your countries? what we might expect if there will be trials on uh, uh, those Russian soldiers who committed, not soldiers, but high level people who committed these the war crimes and the other war crimes. And uh, I also, we also try to explain uh, why it is hard, for example, to put uh, the president of Russia on trial that this, this is what I'm doing here, I'm trying to understand how to do this, actually. Uh, but, uh, as I said, uh, we are trying to explain it. And the first time when Ukraine heard about the International Court of Criminal Court, it was in, for, in 2014, when Crimea was occupied. So now people get used a bit to uh, what is going on here. They know this, they, they get information. And I think they will get more and more. Yes, thank you. And Janet? Um, I agree with you that uh, the Hague is far from home. But um, what uh, it has ensured us as Kenya is that you cannot run away from justice uh, despite being the powerful person or the, being the president of your country. You will still face accountability. I understand that our cases did not go well with the ICC, but it has brought hope to some of the victims who endured uh, violence during the 2007 elections. I 
and now, right now, with the current Ongoi case, uh, we can see victims uh, speaking out with the current, there's a proposed activity by the Trust Fund for Victims. It's, it's been a while, it's been 14 years, but um, the government has not been able to provide what the aid here is providing for the victims. So, yeah, we still have a connection. It's far from home, but there's still a connection. Thank you. I don't know how can I uh, answer because actually I'm very good with my hand. I'm an artist. But maybe I can answer in this way that I stopped draw cartoon instead of maybe reporting or something. I don't know, another thing. Because in Afghanistan, we got many people cannot read or write. Many people cannot understand English. Many people cannot reach to the media as easy as the other part of the world. And I find out cartooning as a universal language. You can see, communicate, and convey the message. And this is my answer to the question I hope it will be after. Thank you so much. Yes, and we have still time for one more question. <coughs> now we have a lot of questions. Okay, um, I don't know. Just girls, could you take to one of the person? So, um, as I report on human rights violations, 
I'll go to the victims. What happened to them? Hear their stories, interview them. That's my source. I'll also follow trials. I will listen to what's going on at the ICC with a perpetrator. That's my source. Um, currently, our government of Kenya is um, preparing to go for elections. I will look into what um, what the government institution is doing or getting prepared to do for elections to avoid any form of any violence happening. I will call out the stakeholders, I will call out the government institutions, I will ask questions so that to provide to my audience on what, what the government is preparing to do. Yeah. As, as to Ukraine and the sources, um, I have to tell you that now we have some problems because we are in the war and sometimes we cannot verify some information. So uh, even if someone says that, well, I hear or can read someone who says that he is in such village or such city and he knows <coughs> that there was explosion and there are lots of people who, are, who died, I cannot write it because we need to verify it. So, so sometimes we have to wait for some time until we get the, uh, the source, the proper source, which will say that yes, it happened or no, it didn't happen. Uh, sometimes there is a kind of censorship because there is information which cannot be given. For example, the, uh, if there is a missile attack and if it hits something, um, we cannot say, like, the information is not given. Did they miss or did they hit the plan or whatever? Uh, because the Russians will, will understand, did they miss or should they put them, should they attack again to, to get what they wanted or they just stop attacks? Thank you so much. So we still can have one question if someone wants to ask. Yeah, so we can, we can end this our event. So I'm really happy that we all came here today and uh, we talked about the importance of the free expression, the danger of the fake news and the challenges of working in a war zone. Thank you so much for everyone who been here today with us. Thank you for our guests and also organizers. Please, huge round of applause to all of us.